What a blessing. Well, we're halfway through January. And all the New Year's... But there is a, a call that comes from above that comes every day. In Matthew 20, Jesus tells a story about a landowner that goes out looking for employees. He's got work to do in his fields. And he hires some in the very beginning, early morning hours of the day. And he tells them he's going to pay them one denarii for working all day. And they were happy to have work. And they went to work. Now, we've come a long way since the day of one denarii for a day's wages. And many people have lost track of what, how, how much money it really takes to run this world. Because this world, in its economics and its programming and institutions, requires money in order to compete with the other nations. And I came across a little comparison where it says that uh, if you took one million dollars and gave it away one dollar a second, it would take you 12 years to give away a million dollars. One dollar a second. And if you took a billion dollars and gave it away one dollar a second, it would take you 32, no, 32 years, 32 years. And then if you took a trillion dollars and gave it away one dollar a second, it would take you 32,000 years to give away $1 trillion. Our minds can't compute on that level. I mean, mine can't. I mean, a, do a, a dollar a day, a dollar a second. And then if you took, uh, currently, the United States uh, debt right now, I mean, it, it, the published debt, the debt they're telling us about, is $18 trillion. Now, if you, if you gave away $1 a second, it would take you 586,000 years to give away $18 trillion. That's a dollar a second. That's pretty fast. One, two, three. And I was thinking about that. Now, if you took a pallet of $100 bills and you had a pallet sitting next to you, five by five, a pallet of $100 bills about that high is a million dollars. You take a semi-truck load of those, now that's a million dollars, just one pallet. You take a semi-trailer, a 48-foot trailer loaded full of $100 bills piled that high, that'd be a billion dollars. A trillion dollars would be that pallet piled higher than the Empire State Building. That's mind-boggling. I, I can't even get my mind around that. And yet we are living on the precipice of time where we know the word is absolutely certain that the day is coming on this planet where no one will be able to function in the financial institutions of the world unless they unite with the enemy of God. There will be so much pressure brought to bear. The Bible calls it the mark of the beast. No one can buy or sell unless you go along with this system. You will not be able to buy food. You'll not be able to purchase water for your house. You'll not be able to pay taxes. Therefore, you'll lose your house. There's going to be some serious pressure brought to bear against the human race. Now, in the midst of that, we understand there will be multitudes and multitudes of people who will be perishing, losing their lives. But there's really not much I can do about saving 7 billion people. But there's more than I know that God can do about coming into my life to save me and to use me to help other people to be saved in this small little circle Amen. that I inhabit. Maybe my neighborhood, a few houses around my neighborhood. 
maybe some of the people I mix with at church. I can be an influence. I can encourage and I can help them to walk with Jesus. But you, if you compared the million dollars to the trillion dollars, that would be a good comparison of what I would, uh, you know, we would be, each individual could be the little pallet. And the world is, oh, oh, I forgot to tell you, the total debt of all the institutions in the United States, not just the government, but all the institutions, all the banks, all the industries, the total derivatives debt in the United States would fill the Washington, D.C. mall with $100 bills as high as the Empire State Building. That's where that whole mall, where the big the pond is, or the lake, or whatever they call it. All that area. Anybody ever been to Washington, D.C.? Well, then you know what we're talking, you've seen it on TV. I mean, as high as the Empire State Building, $100 bills. 700 and some trillion dollars. So, can God handle that? Absolutely. Can I handle that? Absolutely not. I mean, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but part of the all things that, that God would have to do for me is to help me to, to ignore that problem. That's the, the best way I would deal with it. How am I going to influence the bankers? How, you know, I can pray for them, and that's a big influence. I don't want to underestimate that. But personally, am I going to go to some banker's convention, big powwow, and, and, and correct them and tell them how they ought to be doing things? No. The most I can do for them is in prayer, and that is huge. But God has called us to work in this vineyard, the 21st century. And it's no longer a denarii for a day's wages. It's no longer, it's a complicated world. Back, the world was so simple back then. It really was. They had their own issues. They had their own struggles, the same sinful problems that we have. But I can go places in the United States right now and relax and have a lot more peace than I could ever have in a city environment. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Have you ever gone out camping and you wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning and you climb up this mountain and you go up there where there's not a, a, a human being anywhere near where you're at? You're just all alone. You and the bald eagles and the uh, brown eagles and the rabbits and the coyotes are running around and you see the sun come up. You don't have to work real hard to have peace in that situation. It's just kind of there, you know? Now, you can find some peace in your environment, in your, in your hustle and bustle, crowded neighborhoods and insane culture that's going on all around us. It's just rushing back and forth. The neighbors are playing their stereos so loud and you can't even tell what kind of music it is because the, the speakers have been blown out for several months or maybe years and you can't even tell what kind of music it is. It's just all loud. Or there's a train that's right behind your house and, and maybe you've gotten used to it and maybe you haven't. Or maybe somebody at work keeps calling you at 4 in the morning or 7.30 in the evening. You just can't seem to find that sweet peace that gives you so much refreshing. Well, Jesus has called us to work for him in that vineyard. For 39 years, I've been thinking about what I'm going to do when the time of trouble comes. And for 39 years, basically, the Lord has never allowed me to even talk to church members about it. I've only talked to a few in the last four years. He finally allowed me to start talking to just a few church members if, if I could figure out that they were really interested or open and if they wouldn't think I was crazy for talking about it. So the last four years or so, I've started talking to a few members about it. But he's really, he's really indicted me and said, don't talk to anybody about the time of trouble and don't you dare go running to hide anywhere until I tell you to go run and hide somewhere. 
And I used to think, well, would God ever tell a Christian to go somewhere and hide? Would God ever do that? Well, he did it to Elijah. He told Elijah to go. Get out of here. I've got a place for you by the brook here, by the river, and the ravens are going to bring you food. Wow. I, that probably wasn't a, a real difficult command for Elijah to obey. He was probably fed up to the, to the insanity that was all around him, you know, because back in those days, they had already reached the level where they were killing prophets. It didn't bother them to kill prophets. And he knew that as soon as God was finished with him, that they'd be killing him. That's what he figured, I'm sure. And he thought he was the only one anyway. And can you imagine how relieved he was when God said, Elijah, you can go now, way out there in the boondocks. It's really funny. Uh, my wife's dad, uh, he, he comes from the uh, Spanish language culture and the, and, the, and the Mexican culture. He was born in Texas, but he still has that strong culture. And his English is better than he thinks it is, but it's, it's still a little rough. And I remember when Jonathan was a little boy, he was about two and a half or three, maybe, oh no, he was probably four, four or five. And, and Jose, her dad, had heard me say something about the boondocks, because that's what Okies, Okies use that term some. And he was telling Jonathan that day, he was saying something about your daddy uh, grew up in the duck boons. The, the duck boons instead of the boondocks. <laughs> but can you imagine how, how, how relieved and how excited Elijah was when God says, you can go, run, go out there in the boonies. Go way out there. And it's going to be so awesome, the ravens are going to bring you food. <laughs> that must have been a big vacation for him. But I'll tell you for sure, as my understanding, until God tells us to go, we need to, we need to know where we're supposed to be. Amen. And we need to know what we're supposed to be doing for Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. I mean, we need to be doing this for Jesus. Not to earn anything, but just because he's worthy. He deserves more than we could ever give him. So why wouldn't we give him all that we got? If you understand how much he really deserves, you're going to give him everything you have and ask him to, to do things in your life so that you can give him more. Amen. Praise God. But I want to look with you a little bit at this awesome calling. God calls us. He calls us to do many things. But this one I have found in the Bible is the most important calling there is to sinners like you and me. This is the invitation from God, the invitation from Jesus and from heaven. This is the one that we must answer if we would answer any other call there is. Come to me, Jesus is calling. He's calling that. Come to me. And I understand from the Bible that many people come to him and they don't even know his name. It's true. Recently, in the last decade, there was a lady living in <coughs> Cambodia. Or Laos. Laos. It was Laos. It was, well, Laos or Cambodia, it's kind of, I can't remember for sure. But she got some terrible cancer. And they were poor. And her parents were dead and her grandpa was there. And they were poor. They couldn't afford to go anywhere to get any treatments. But she knew she'd been diagnosed. And the cancer was terminal. And they knew that unless something happened, that she was going to die. The grandpa began to tell her about some of the stories he remembered hearing as a child. About this second God. Didn't know his name, but all he remembered was they referred to him as the second God. And that's all they knew. So she started praying to the second God. And a, a few weeks went by. And one night in the middle of the night, a shining, glorious being appeared at the foot of her bed. 
And he said, I have come from the second God has sent me. And he has come to heal you. And, and he touched her body and there was some healing, but not complete healing. And then he told her where to go to find help. And he directed her to certain Seventh-day Adventist ministers by name in America. And she was able somehow to get the money and she actually came and she actually met these folks. And the last word I got was that she was healed of cancer. She was a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. She had returned to Laos and was handing out Steps to Christ and Bible studies. Second God was Jesus, the second of the Godhead. But that's all her grandpa knew. God is so amazing that he will honor childlike faith for anybody who hears his voice. And guess how many people hear the voice of God on planet Earth? Every human being hears the voice of God. They may not acknowledge it. They may not accept it. They may not believe it. They may, they may not even understand it because there's so much darkness. There's so much confusion. There's so much ignorance. Hosea 4, 6, God says, my people, and guess how many people on planet earth are his? Guess how many of them belong to him? All of them. All human beings are rightfully his. And with a, with a broken heart, through Hosea, God cries out, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And the Holy Spirit is working to call people to salvation. Come to me, all you who are struggling and are carrying heavy burdens that humans were not designed or created to carry. You and I were not designed to, cre to, cre to carry sin. We were not designed to carry injury from other sinners around us. We were not designed for that. That's one of the main reasons Jesus comes as our big brother. He comes to give us help. He comes to help us in our struggles. He comes to fight for us and to fight with us and to fight in us. He comes to help us. Amen. And he says, come to me. And I will give you rest. I will give you power. I will give you hope. I will give you the desire to get up and try again when you think you're going to give up. When you think there's no more I can do, I'm just going to live out the rest of my life and hopefully die sooner than later. There are many people in that condition. And Jesus is calling. Answering this call, I believe, is the greatest decision a human being could ever make. And I believe that this call is given every day. Amen. And I believe that we must, we must uh, intensely, with great desire and great ambition, great hope and great faith, I think we should answer this call every day in a great way. I believe God deserves to be answered in a great way every day, every morning, early in the morning. He deserves our first and foremost attention. He's giving this call every day. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. If you think this is not a daily call, then you've just stopped learning. You can't continue learning unless you answer the call of coming to Jesus on a daily basis. Not going to happen. Learn from me. He's the only true teacher in the universe. Anybody else who's a good teacher is simply reflecting Jesus. Even if they're an atheist, if they're a good teacher, they're reflecting Jesus and they don't even know it. He's the true teacher. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. 
you will find rest. You'll find restoration. You'll find hope. You'll find courage. You'll find strength for your entire being. For your entire being. Physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Jesus said, I will, I will be your all and all because I created you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Don't you know King David learned that? He figured that out. He saw that. He tasted of it. That's why he sang so much. That's why he wrote so many awesome, powerful, incredible songs. Because he knew this was true. He said, this what I, one thing is I desire, he said, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now he wasn't talking about the temple. He was talking about the presence of God. The living house of God. The holy presence of God. That's what he was talking about. He said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. What that means? I'd rather be a janitor for God than to have all the wealth of the rich, of those who are rich. This guy knew something. This guy had learned something. He knew that it was far greater to carry Christ than this world. John 20, Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. Now I know that was with his inner circle, the apostles. But I also know this is for anyone who has ears to hear. Amen. And we're talking about answering the call of God. How many of you believe that God wants to use you to reach the people in your neighborhood. Yeah. It's true, whether you believe it or not. You may not believe it, but it is true. He has chosen you. He has especially gifted you. And he stands ready to give you all the power and wisdom and skill and ability you need to bring the gospel to everyone in your neighborhood. Amen. He said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. I am the vine, you are the branches. This is how easy it is. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is, I am the vine, you are the branches. All we need to do is be attached to Jesus. We need to be connected to Jesus. We need to be clinging to Jesus. He who abides, he who lives in me, and I live in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are burned, destroyed. If you live in me, and my words live in you, you will ask what you desire. Wow. Wow. And it shall be done for you. And the reason he can say that is if you abide in him and his words abide in you, you're only going to ask what he desires. And that's fact. Because you will have received a new heart. Complete with heavenly desires, holy desires, balanced desires, pure desires. And it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so, will, so you will be my disciples. Answering the call to bear much fruit. In James 1, but be doers of the word, and not just hearers, Becoming deceived, if that's what you're doing. If you're just listening and not doing anything about what you're hearing, then you're deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. 
for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. How forgetful are we? You know, there's, there's two signs of being a human. But it, goes, it actually goes, there's two signs of being old, of getting old, that you're getting old. There's two, there's two evidences that you're getting old. One is that you get forgetful, and the other one is I can't remember what it was. <laughs> but that's really true about just humans. When, when we're talking about God, when we're talking about who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to act, we forget pretty quickly, don't we? And we can pull some pretty big shenanigans as soon as we're out in the crowd, as soon as, we, as soon as we walk away from that prayer closet and our Bible study desk, and we're out maybe, maybe not even 15 minutes on the highway, yeah, that old, that old roaring lion can rise up in us pretty quickly. And we could even go a few months and just be sweeter than pie. I mean, Never even grumble at that crazy kook that just almost ran us off the road. But you let three or four months go by, and we're ready to pull a machine gun out and blow his tires out from under him. I wouldn't shoot anybody, but I'd sure shoot some tires. Slow him down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm the only one like that, so... One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is right what Jesus said right here. This is so off the charts. It's just wow. It's just huge, major wow. He said, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Wow. I mean, we can just stop there. and That's, that's more than we can swallow, right? That, that's more than we can hold. That's more than we can receive. That's bigger than the universe. Because God's bigger than the universe. And he just said, if I believe in him, I can do the same works he did. I'm going, wow. I mean, I can actually someday pray the way Jesus prayed? Really? Yes. Amen. And that's based on the promise of Jesus. That's based on the testimony of Jesus. John 14, 26. John 16, 13. If you're not claiming the precious promises, you're dying and you will be dead forever. John 3.16 is one of the most precious promises in the whole universe. How many of you want to live without John 3.16? Boy, not me. I want to live under it. I want it on top of me. I want it all around me. I want it under me. I want the whole thing. Amen? But God's word is full of so many promises. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, God says that we receive the divine nature by partaking of these precious promises. Wow, this is a big promise. The commandment says, thou shalt not lie. What a beautiful promise that is. All I have to do is answer the call. All I have to do is come to Jesus, give him my life, and he'll, he'll get rid of the lying out of my life. Amen. He'll knock it out. He'll kill it. He'll crucify it. He'll wipe it out. He's the only one who can. Amen. Amen. I, and all I have to do is believe in Jesus to do the works he did. I don't need to go doing the works he did so that I can get good enough. All I need to do is do the, believe in him and he'll make me good. I like that. I like that routine a lot better. Amen? Amen. That yoke is a, is a lot easier than the one a lot of church people are carrying. He says, and greater works than these. And I believe a major part of the greater works than these you will do is that we get to do them longer. He only, he, he, he only was able to do them three and a half years when God really... Cut him loose. And then the key is, because he says, I'm going to my father. And verse 13 says, and I will be at the, whatever you ask the father in my name, he's going to give it to you. 
And the first thing we need is a new heart. So that we'll ask for the right things after that. I mean, we, we desperately need this new heart experience. So that our desires are appropriate. Our ambitions are balanced and honorable. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Anything in Jesus Christ. If you ask for anything that's in Jesus, you will get it. Amen. And I believe there's a lot more in Jesus than what we've been declaring. John 7, he who believes in me. Oh, this is the Amplified Bible. Anybody ever heard about the Amplified Bible? This really, this, is, this gives all the English meanings as much as possible, the nuances. See, Greek says so many more things than what we can say with one English word that the Amplified Bible says, well, here's, here's all the English words that really talks about what that one Greek word is saying. So he who believes in me, and then who cleaves to and trusts in, who clings or cleaves to and trusts in and relies on me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being, down deep, way down deep, shall flow continuously springs of rivers, springs and rivers of living water. I like that. I claim that promise every day. Because I know I need to answer that call every day. I need that promise every day. I need to renew that promise every day. I do. I invite I, I, I pray to the Father. I say, Father, let the living word of your Son penetrate deep into my innermost being. That's what it means in Hebrews 4.12 when it says that it's sharp two-edged sword even into the bone marrow. It means, it means he wants in there deep down, way down, deep, 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 all the way down, deep, innermost being. And I asked the Father, I said, let your two-edged living word, sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, penetrate deep into my innermost being and kill my sinful nature. Crucify it. Mortify it. Destroy it. Hold it in check. Help me, Lord. I am a desperately needy, helpless sinner. Please, God, do this for me today, and I know that I'll be able to thank you forever because of what you have done today. Amen. Amen. And somebody said, well, I prayed that 20 years ago. Do I have to pray that every day? Man, you got a bad attitude. Does God have to give you air every day? I mean, how valuable is air? It's a lot more valuable than $18 trillion. I'll guarantee you that. But if God gave you a million dollars, you'd be so excited, you'd be shouting victory all the way down Main Street. And the next day you got up, you'd say, oh, I'm so glad I won that money. And the next day you go, oh, I'm so glad I got that money. Thank you for letting me win that money. But here God is wanting to give you the power to do the works of Jesus. And it puts us to sleep. I guarantee you, it didn't put him to sleep when he was paying for it. Peter, James, and John, they fell asleep. But not Jesus. Answering the call. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Answering the call. Answering the call. I remember I was 10 years old. My dad was a drunk, and they had divorced six years previously. My stepdad was a drunk, and he was hardly ever around. And he was a carpenter. I mean, he wasn't a carpenter. He was a contractor. He could build a house from the ground up. He'd do the dirt work. He'd do the ditch work. He'd do the concrete work. He'd do the plumbing work. He could do it all. The guy was like a genius, and he was skilled, and he was amazing. But he was drunk most of the time, so he couldn't do much. And, 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 and when, when people are drunk a lot, they waste their money. They, they, they misspend their money. They might as well just take their money and throw it out the back door because that's how it goes. 
So we were, we lived, we didn't, we didn't have much. But my buddies, their dads and uncles or whoever, they were, they, they would, they had, you know, back in when you're 10 years old, your buddies have tree houses. And they, and they, and they, I mean, they, these guys, they were, they had their lives together. So they had nice tree houses. I'm not just talking about just tree houses. These were nice tree houses. And they'd invite you over, you know, and you'd go and play and you'd hang out in their tree house. And then you'd go home and you'd go, wow, I, I, I sure, I would like to have a tree house. And my next door neighbor was my best buddy. He didn't have a tree house either because he didn't have a tree to put it in. <laughs> but I had a tree. I had a good tree for a tree house. <clears throat> Ten years old. And so I couldn't get my stepdad to build me one. He could have built the best tree house in town. But he just never got around to it. And it came to me one day why don't you just build your own tree house? At the time, I had, had, I had no idea that that was God talking to me, but I know now it was God talking to me. Because God cares if a little boy has a tree house or not. Amen. He does. And he cares if a little girl has a dollhouse or not. And there's a lot of dads who should have, but they never got around to building their little girls a dollhouse either, or a playhouse. So my buddy and I decided we're going to build our own tree house. Wow. I can't believe that tree survived. I mean, we drove some big spikes into that tree, anchoring those two-by-sixes and two-by-fours and even maybe, I don't know, some two-by-eights. I don't know how big, the, but we had to put the anchors in there, and man, we didn't even use a level. I didn't know how to use a level. I was 10 years old. But I built me a tree house. And it was as level as I could see. And it was a two-decker. It was two stories. And the top story had walls on it. It wasn't just a piece of stuff you lay on and the whole world could shoot you, you know, and throw rocks at you. And that's what they did in not my neighborhood. If they caught you in the treehouse, they'd be shooting rocks at you, throwing rocks at you. So we had to have walls to protect ourselves. And man, we had a stockpile of rocks up there too. If they came to attack us, they were in for big news. Of course, I wasn't going to church much when I was 10. <laughs> If I had been, I'd probably still had the rocks. That's not good, children. You shouldn't do that. I'm just telling you what happens when you grow up not going to church. You, you do things you shouldn't do. But I know this. We would go up there, and we would actually sleep all night in the top of that tree with the stars above us. And it was just like being in heaven. It was just beautiful. It was incredible. And those are, those are the kind of things. I mean, how can a 10-year-old build a two-story tree house? Well, we did it. And it was beautiful. At least to us, it was beautiful. And to God, it was beautiful. We did the best we could. And now I know it was just a bunch of garbage, but we did the best we could. Don't worry about what it's going to look like or what anybody else is going to say about it. Whatever you're dreaming, whatever, you, whatever the Spirit is telling you to do, you need to answer the call of coming to Jesus so that you can do it. The enemy, he loves beating up humans. He'll tell you you're not smart enough to do what you've been dreaming about doing. He'll tell you you're not young enough to do what you've been dreaming about doing. He'll tell you you're not old enough to do what you think you, God wants you to do. He'll tell you everything he can to get you to, 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 to just give up and neglect or forget that special and that precious dream. That he's given just to you. God has called us to pray without ceasing. 
The only way I can achieve that is simply to come to Jesus. Say, Lord, you're the only one. I, I've heard what people have to say about praying without ceasing, and it all sounds pretty good. But you're the only one who can really clarify this for me. And you're the only one that can make this happen, make it real, make it personal. So, Lord, I hear you, I hear you talking. I mean, you know, I hear you talking, Lord. I hear your voice. I hear you saying that I need to pray without ceasing. But I need your Holy Spirit so that I can even taste what that's all about. So they can begin to taste it. Answering the call. There's people in your neighborhood who are so worried, they're worried sick. They're so depressed, they can't even, they can't hardly, they can't go without drugs. They've got to take drugs to get happy and then they've got to take drugs to calm down so they can sleep. It's, it's a sad world we're living in. You may even be here like that. And the good shepherd knows exactly how to lead you out of that. And he knows how to use you to lead other people out of that stuff. Now we're not talking about just normal run of the mill, let's see what we might be able to do. We're talking about the works of Jesus Christ. Amen. I had to go call portering one summer. I don't know why, but I had to. I was married. We had one baby, right? We already had two babies. Oh, yeah, we already had two babies. I pr I'm probably the worst call porter in the history of the world. I don't like asking people for money for God's books. I just, something bothers me about that. And it was, it, it's really hard for me to do that. So I ended up giving away more books than I sold. Well, you don't make much money because you've got to buy the books. You got to pay for the books that, you, that you're trying to sell. And back in those days, those books were expensive. And I remember the poor people who, most of the time, the people that wanted them couldn't afford them. And I just couldn't go on down the street without giving them some books. You don't make much money that way. But that's what I believe God was telling me to do. And, and I did it. And we were broke. We were broke. If it hadn't been for the goodness of this church member, beautiful man and his wife, Al and Ruth Nolan, if they hadn't opened their house up, given us a place to stay, we would have cooked. We would have cooked in Dallas that year because we wouldn't have been able to afford an air conditioning utility bill. We couldn't even afford rent. We didn't tell anybody except God. And these two came up and said, you know, we'd just like to have you guys stay for us, with us this summer. I hear you're going to be call portering up here in our city. And, and I was a student pastor at their church up in North Dallas, Garland, Texas. So we'd just love for you to come stay with us. We'd just love to have you and your babies with us this summer. And, and I said, well, how much is that going to cost us? Oh, that's not going to cost you anything. He was an engineer and she was a registered nurse and they didn't need the money. And he said, nothing is not going to cost you anything. We just want to be a blessing for you guys. Wow, what a blessing we had that summer. We could actually have air conditioning. In Dallas, Texas. And if you don't have air conditioning in Dallas, Texas, you better be half gorilla or something. Because it's rough. Well, I got done call portering and I was, we were still broke. Because I didn't make a penny. I lost money. <laughs> but you keep coming to Jesus. When there's nothing else you can do, you can always come to Jesus. Amen. And I believe then and I believe now. I wouldn't tell anybody. I wouldn't go and ask anybody for money and I wouldn't borrow any money. I'd just tell God about it and wait and see what he would do. My wife was with me on this and I know God actually came to her one day and spoke to her out loud so that she could so that she wouldn't leave me <laughs> basically so that she wouldn't think I was crazy because I wasn't asking her dad for money you know most of the time if you got rich parents you go ask them for money and they give you some money right and he would have he would have given us some money but we both decided but God told her says you don't need to worry your needs will always be met 
as long as you keep trusting in me. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you something. A woman cannot stay with a man who lives by faith unless she also has faith. It's not going to work out very well. And so I praise God for her faith that she asked God to give her help. We got done. We went back to Oceanside, California, where her family lived. And, and I preached in the Oceanside Church, where I'd been an elder. And I didn't tell anybody anything. I just told them we were going back to college. Well, I didn't know. That was a faith. I said that by faith. I said, we're going back to Texas. I'm going back to college in my sermon. I said, so nice seeing you folks again for a while, but we're headed back to school. Well, that was a, that was a statement of faith because we didn't have the money for the, for the entry fees. We didn't have the, the money you had to have at least $1,000 down for your tuition to get in. We didn't have any of that. And I sure wasn't going to ask Uncle Sam. At least at that point I wasn't. I was still, no way. After the sermon, I'm out there in the foyer greeting people. A man who had never been to the Oceanside Church before, had never seen me, I'd never seen him, he didn't know anybody there. He came walking up and he gave the pastor, Norm Farley, who was standing next to me, he gave him a check for $1,000 and said, give that to that young man so he can, for school. I don't know what his expenses are, but he... But I want, to, I want to give $1,000 for him to go to school. That's exactly what I needed, $1,000 to get into school. And then the Lord worked on me and he humbled me. And about in the middle of September, he broke me down. He said, Paul, he said, you served in the United States Navy. Why can't you ask the government for a loan? I thought it was the devil at first. <laughs> but he finally convinced me that it was him. So we got a loan. That was exciting. God works in mysterious ways. He tried to get me to join the military for a whole year. And I was sure that had to be the devil. And I finally joined the military. And as soon as I obeyed that little voice, which I thought was Satan, I really did. As soon as I obeyed that little voice to go do something that I thought God would never tell me to do, my whole life took off like a rocket. I wouldn't even have met Esper if I hadn't have joined the Navy. A lot of things wouldn't have happened. So be open. And be brave. And understand this. God has chosen you. To do great and mighty things. And it's so easy that all you have to do is keep coming to Jesus each day. I want to invite you to stand with me as we pray. As we pray here this morning. Or it's actually a little bit after morning now. I guess I knocked that off. Okay. <clears throat> a long time... I've had this dream to go to the Newport Pier or down there by the Mission Inn in the mall at Riverside. I've had this ambition, this dream, this desire for years, for decades to take my guitar down there and just sing and have a, have a hat there so they can drop money in it and, and have a sign that I'm going to use the money for, you know, something. For maybe my friend's, my friend's orphanage down in Peru. We've got a friend that runs a, 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 you know, a, a, a place for orphans and for moms, you know, single moms. We could do stuff like that. And, and I know that I don't play guitar. I really don't play guitar well enough to do that. But I know that as soon as I do it, God's going to work miracles to make them hear stuff that I'm not even playing. And in sync. And I've allowed, I've allowed the devil to interfere, to cheat me and to discourage me and to frustrate me and to keep me from error. I've never done it. I've never done it. 
But I, by God's grace, plan to do it before I die and before this year is over. With God's help, I'm going to do that. And they may throw rotten tomatoes at me. But I'm going to do it. And if I have to take Richard with me and let him play beside me, and I'll just fake like I'm playing. <laughs> we're going to get this thing done. I have a baritone and a trombone. I want to go to the, to the Newport Beach Harbor Pier, and I want to play when the saints go marching in or something. I want to do something. To get people to at least know that somebody's excited about Jesus. So what, what, what can you do? What, what is your little dream? Maybe you don't even have one. Well, I know he's here. I know the guy, the, the being, the wonderful Father God, he's here. He'll give you a dream. If you don't have one, he'll give it to you. God will do things that you wish you'd have dreamed about and then he'll just drop it on you and you didn't even see it coming. Amen. It's better than your dreams. I had that happen yesterday afternoon. I went to a Catholic graveside funeral service. I knew the priest was going to be in charge over there. But the family... I loved dearly and I wanted them to know that I cared about their grandma dying. Just wanted to be there. Priest never showed up, never showed up, never showed up. So I said, well, can I say a prayer? Oh, yeah. And, and, and I went up and I, and I said a prayer and I included in my prayer that if the priest was stuck in traffic or lost, that the Lord would help him to arrive quickly, soon, so that the, the family's needs could be met and this priest could do something for the family. Well, another 20 or 30 minutes rolled by and he still didn't show up. And they were, and, and so the, the cemetery people, they had to get things done. They had to get ready for the next appointments. And so they, were, they, they went ahead and raised the, the casket up on the, on the scissor lift to put it into the, uh, the mausoleum. And I thought, man, that's not right. That shouldn't have happened without somebody saying something. But I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know what to do. I wasn't in charge. And I knew that a, a, a major portion of the family was there and they didn't, they didn't like what I had just done to their brother. We just baptized him. They didn't like that because Catholics get baptized when they're babies. And they, they were worried that he was being led into, into a cult. And they were pretty upset. But my heart broke. I, didn't, that was just, I just didn't feel good about that. So I said, well, is it okay... I told somebody to go up and said, go see if I can say some more and pray for the family. And they said, okay, yeah. And they knew I was Seventh-day Adventist. They said, yeah, yeah, come on up. All I was going to do is just say one sentence and pray. God gave me a whole sermon and I had to obey. I guarantee you, there's a whole bunch of Catholics that never heard a funeral like that one. And I hope to hear a whole bunch more. I told them that all they need to do to answer the voice of Jesus when he comes for his children is to answer his voice each day right now. Learn how to hear his voice. Learn how to answer his voice. Just say yes to Jesus. And when he comes, you'll be able to say yes to him. Even if you're dead, you'll be able to say yes. And you'll come out of that grave. That's how awesome our incredible God is. I say yes to Jesus. Amen. I choose Jesus. When the, when the devil tempts me, all I have to do is say, Satan, I choose Jesus. Get behind me right now. That's all I have to say. His yoke is easy. Most people don't think that the devil talks to the whole human race. Well, I guarantee you he talks to every human being in this world. Most people don't even believe he's there. I guarantee you he's there. 
If he wasn't there, Jesus would not have gone to the cross to give us the help we need to defeat his enemy. So may God be with you the same way he was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because he loves you the same that he loved them. You are just as precious and valuable and important to him as any of those people you read about in the Bible. You are precious to him. And he wants to lead you in a path of victory, of joy, of peace, and success. Amen. He wants to hear you talk about it someday in a place called heaven. He's going to give you center stage and he wants to hear you tell the whole universe how precious he is to you. It starts right here. It starts right now, every day. God bless you. In Christ Jesus as you go in faith go with him amen god bless you as you go